So we're out in Spokane, Washington, and we're in it. We're staying in an area that is being gentrified. It's the older homes, real villagey kind of look. So you have some really nice fixed up homes and then you have some shit shacks, right? And then you have some nice homes and then another set of crap houses that haven't been taken care of. And the area, the shopping around it, grocery stores are coming up. But last night we had to go get some things at the grocery store and we went to this place called Grocery Outlet. And I don't know what grocery outlet is, but I know the guy who's sitting out front looks like he's been on meth for about a, a, his whole life. No teeth, the whole bit, right? And you're walking through this store and Ginger finds this creamer, this uh, creamer for our coffee that we usually get. And at home, it's like five bucks or something. We get a, we, she picks it up and she goes, it's two fifty. I'm like, oh, wow, that's weird. You know, and we're walking around, you see these big, and when you see something that says outlet, you know they're buying in bulk, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Costco or Sam's or something. But we're walking around and there's like, so uh, as a little kid, my mom used to buy me Fruity Pebbles. And I love that cereal. I still to this day, I drool over it, but I know I shouldn't eat it. And so I don't. So I see this boxes. And it's Fruity Pebbles and some, and this couple other words below it. I'm like, that's not Fruity Pebbles. That's like, it's like it was an experiment that they beta tested in an area and it didn't work. And they just sold it to this grocery store. Yeah. And I told Ginger, I was like, she, she goes, oh, by the way, I figured out why the creamer was half the price. I was like, what's that? It's 30 days away from expiration. Oh. And I'm like, oh. And so as we're walking out in the parking lot, I said, you know, we live in a very sheltered area. You know, we joke about the Range Rover count. You know, between our house and Ginger Studio, how many Range Rovers are you going to see? You know, here, it's more like how are people surviving? You know, this is sort of a real snapshot, even in an area that is being upgraded and people are coming in and they're buying these little houses and they're fixing them up and they're turning them into airbnbs or stuff like that but the rest of the world is really really struggling it and is. yeah and so i'm really and i don't and if you watch the news and you watch nvidia you would have no idea of what's happening and that's really what we experienced when we came out for this show for Ginger. And that was, we had heard years and years and years that this place was like, you're gonna go to this and you will be nonstop. You will be selling stuff. You will have, you'll have lines of people waiting to buy and talk to vendors before the show actually started on Friday, on Saturday talking of setup on Friday and they're, oh my gosh, you're going to be like running back to your, your trailer to pull more stuff. You'll be running back to your trailer and buying, pull more stuff and pull more stuff and more stuff. And they'll come in here on Saturday morning at nine o'clock and it'll be just swarms of people. You'll be, it'll be sardines, like people stacked up like sardines in the aisles. Nope. No, not even close. I mean, I ran back to the trailer once to grab stuff, but that was like mid afternoon on Saturday. It's a two day show. And what I reckon, what we recognized was the people didn't show up. And that could be a combination of maybe marketing, but I don't think so. But I think it's more representative of what is happening in our economy and what the average American, average household who makes average household income is experiencing. They just don't have the money. We've, we've been talking about this for months, you know, you and I, and uh, the stock market is not the economy. And <clears throat> if you just watch financial news with all the posts that are 
millionaires or hundred thousand heirs. And, you know, their yeah. job is to manage money and, and, and gather assets. Well, you gather assets by, by, by uh, stoking up the market, not by saying anything bad. So, and then you have government reports that come out and we've talked about this on the platinum channel for, for a year. And, the the original the original headline number comes out and it's great and the market gets affected and goes up and the next month the next month number comes out and they revise the original one from last month down you know by percentage points yeah well it doesn't matter no one no one looks at that so they they manipulate the market to me it's market manipulation if you can't get a decent report I mean I've worked in the corporate world and we had very close reports there. I don't remember ever having to revise any kind of production or manufacturing report, you know, month to month because I got it wrong each and every month by magnitudes wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you get to thinking about that and you're like, well, how can we even be investors? You know, it's, it's, a, it's manipulated in that way. You have got reports coming out and, and even if they're bad, they're good. And then you've got Steve Leisman coming out and tell you, you know, oh, well, let me look here. Oh, whoa, whoa, page 973. Here's something that's good. Right. Or if we have an inflation report, you know, and well, what's it? We're going to take this, 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 this. We'll take out energy. We'll take out food. We'll take out housing. We'll take out transportation. What else do you need to live? We'll take all that stuff out. Okay. And then we'll have this core, you know, because right. all that other stuff is, is a very volatile. You know, we don't want that in our report. Right. You know, that so throws it off. They come out and tell us, you know, inflation is, you know, 3.8%, you know, month over month, whatever that, that may be. But since 2020, inflation's up over 20% on everything. And it's even higher on other things. I mean, pay your house insurance these days, live your property taxes. Okay. Just go buy a new car, you know, all that right. stuff. Go go buy food, like you were just talking about. Um, no, the average person is feeling that and they don't care. That, oh, my gosh, inflation uh, oh, month over month stayed at 0.03% or whatever it is, you know, because that's still going up. Okay, it's going up every month. It's just going up less. Okay, so your paycheck doesn't go up, you know, 0.03% every month. And so people are making choices. And and I just saw that the other day, you know, lower income Americans, this is from a, a company that watches travel, dial back their travel spending in April. Uh, because of reduced savings, high credit card delinquencies, and inflations uh, on their household budget. They're not traveling anymore. And eventually this will get around to other other groups of, you know, economic groups. And you're already seeing it down in your area. You're seeing, uh, you know, your Airbnb neighbors, they're not, they're selling their houses because no one's coming down anymore. Right. And you live in a great area, right on the coast, you know, a beautiful area. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's, you know, I was looking at, uh, I get these Redfin uh, real estate notifications. And so in my area, and granted it is a 1% kind of area, we just got in at when it was real cheap. Um, but we're, I'm today I got one house price reduction, $400,000, you know, went from 2.9 to 2.5. So and what that's telling me is that's an Airbnb house. I know the house. I walk by it when I go on my morning walk or morning run. And so I know that house. I know that house back in 2010 was $900,000. Okay. It got as high over, I think probably the last purchase was over 3 million. Now they're reducing it by almost a half a million bucks. Right. And this is an Airbnb house. And so they're seeing that pressure. So, you know, you have that lower, you know, average income, household income market that's been feeling this, that's been experiencing this. And now you're starting to see it from a real estate perspective in my area, particularly, you're seeing the one percenters are now feeling it or the two percenters, let's say are now feeling it and they know what's happening and now they're just scrambling to get out. And I think to get out before it totally falls apart. Right. Exactly. And they know it's coming. Um, I mean, I think the average American household doesn't know that they're, the water is boiling or is about to start boiling. But those in, in that top two, 3% income earners of the world that buy opportunity assets like real estate that we saw, you know, crumble back in 
the great financial crisis are now going, oh, wait a second. The game has completely changed. We're so different than we were 14 years ago, you well, know, as an economy. Yeah, as interest people. rates went to zero for 12 yeah. years. Oh, yeah. Now they're not. Now people have to pay interest. And like you said, not only is it, I think residential is going to get caught up into this whole commercial real estate. And I just saw a report uh, from the FDIC, which is the you know the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that bails out banks and, and you know your you know two hundred thousand dollars of your money in an account, it had a quarterly banking profile report, and it said that banks are saddled with more than a half a trillion dollar in paper losses on their balance sheet, due largely to exposure to the residential real estate market. They say that the number of lenders on its problem bank list rose last quarter. According to the agency, these banks are on the brink of insolvency due to financial, operational, managerial weakness, and a combination of such issues. So the storm is on the horizon. It's not like we haven't been talking about it on the Platinum Channel for a long time, or even other YouTubers, you know. But yeah. do you hear it from the government? Do you hear it from no. CNBC? Do you hear it from anybody? You, and you won't. The you won't the until January. The consumer is resilient. You know, that's all we hear. You and I and I came to this conclusion because I a gentleman he was a they made furniture you know furniture tables that kind of thing he's out of Montana and he walked up to me on Sunday and he's like how's the show going and I was like well you know to be honest with you it's a little disappointing he goes well you know I've been doing this for eight years and honestly this is the first show that like has been like this and I think about it that time frame eight years ago where were we. You know, that's 2014. Is that right? Yeah. So 2016. 2016. The cost of money was cheap. It got cheaper into 2020, 2021, 2022. Got in 2023 and money started to get more expensive. And that was 2023, I think. Um, so it would have been June of 23 when the last last year's show here at the Farm Chick Show in Spokane, Washington. Now we're feeling all those interest rate moves um, coming into the system. And so it really, you know, really explains why this show really was one tenth of the traffic that last year's show was and the year before that. So we're now seeing that wave starting to hit the beach and it's starting to move up into the dunes, which on the other side of the dunes are the big houses, right? And he said, you know, I just think it's a presidential election year. And I'm like, no, dude, it's not just a president election year. You won't be notified publicly until after the election that you've just been slammed, that your house is now flooded and that you're underwater. You won't be notified publicly, but you will know it. You're no, you're feeling it today in June of 2024. You will probably start feeling it as an average American, even more so in August, September of 2024. Well, we, we've talked about the two legs that's destroying your purchasing power, okay? And that's inflation, mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay? So inflation to me is, is not 3.9% inflation if you go and you buy groceries is 25%, okay, what, than it was in 2020, mm -hmm. okay? And the other thing is the government is overspending and we're in so much debt that we are, they call it printing money, but we're issuing treasury bills left and right. And treasury bills are, are a good place. I, I think I saw yesterday Warren Buffett owns 3% of the entire treasury bill market <laughs> in the US, okay? Wow. When you have, you know, 158 billion in that you know you're probably making pretty good but <clears throat> what we're seeing is that uh, the u.s debt level rose by 184 billion or 1.1 percent in the first quarter uh to 17.69 trillion so the overall borrowing levels are three and a half trillion above where they were in 2019 okay so we keep spending and spending <clears throat> and when you look at uh, basically you know where do we get this money? It has always been from overseas, China, Japan, you know, some of our banks, some of us retail investors, but mostly overseas. But over, you know, 
the last year, the Treasury Department says China cut its holdings of treasuries uh, from 600 or 869.3 billion in March of last year to 767.4 billion of March of this year. So they're they're cutting back on their on their purchasing. Uh, and then in October, they're going to have this big meeting in Russia about BRICS. OK, they <clears throat> they are, 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 are moving away from the U.S. dollar, it appears, OK, yeah. along with a lot of other countries in the world. And so our pur purchasing power as Americans will continue to decline. And so, again, again with, along with inflation, that's what's really hurting not only the lower class, but the middle class, too. Yeah. I mean, in, in, you think about it, this is a game of confidence when it comes to the economy on a global scale. And if you are a country that is has been dominant since the 40s, and you have been sort of the policeman of all the world's waterways, and then all of a sudden you step off onto a spending bender, and you're riddling, your, your de, you're devaluing your purchasing power and you're a country that has to, you know, has been supporting them, you're going to start to lose confidence every morning. You're going to start to recalibrate and you're going to start to go, what's the alternative? And I think that's, you look at gold prices, you know, gold has risen over the last 10 years. Um, granted, it's not an asset that I can haul across the border or easily get, you know, pay for anything with. And I think that supports the whole, you know, crypto, Bitcoin in particular, um, you know, adoption that we've seen on a major financial level with well, corporations yeah, and stuff like when that. When BlackRock gets into it, you know that it's going to be worth something because they're buying up. Well, in fact, I think the uh, it's nine ETFs of the big companies once since the ETF started in January, it bought up 1% of the Bitcoin already. Yeah. So For a million, million Bitcoin. They bought a million Bitcoin. So uh they're actually one one twenty first of 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 the yeah. entire market. And well, that's and under a year. It's yes. And that's a I mean that's a very good point to you know focus on is that didn't happen since 2013. That happened in the last since February, right? And so if we're seeing that shift with the big corporations, we're seeing that shift with big countries. What should we be doing as individuals? How should we be processing this? And I know you and a lot of the other platinum members have been buying U.S. Treasuries because for 30 years, U.S. Treasury yields went like this, right? So, um, you know, you made money in bonds and then bonds. Then we had that pivot, what, starting in 22, I believe. And now we're like, what? what's a... A ten years right right around probably four point eight to five percent right now. I think it was four point three five this morning. Oh, it so it's yeah. gone down quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've it's, it's been fluctuating. Yeah, the jobs report, the Jolts report came out today, and and their their best jobs openings. You know, I think it was declined by two hundred sixty nine thousand from the previous month. Wow. Um, um, so there's less job openings and then the job quits were up a little bit, but on Friday, we're going to get the, the unemployment report, you know? And so, and I look at what's happening in my degree in economics, which I have to dust off from 40 some years ago. I look at, we're slowing, the economic growth is slow. Our GDP just got revised down from 2 point something to 1.3, okay? Yeah. Uh, inflation is still sticky and high. OK, it's not coming down. We look at the PC, you see all these things. It's not coming down. OK. And the last stick to fall is unemployment. And we're starting to see job openings not there. And if we come in and we're starting to I think we're at three point nine percent. If we get up to four and start going up and people start losing their jobs, you know what that is? That's stagflation. Yeah. It gives us slow economic growth, high uh, inflation uh, and high unemployment. OK. And uh, that's that's stagflation. And if we get into that scenario, we haven't been in that since the seventies, and I was alive then. Um, it's it's going to be it's going to be hard on a lot of people. But our Federal Reserve Chairman said, "I see no stag, I see no inflation." But that's what he's there to say because he doesn't want to start a panic. We do have an election coming up, and I do believe that 
at every office now, even the even the Fed is is political. I think so too. I think. Well, let me ask you this question: After the election, let's say we get into next year, do they raise Fed rates and get aggressive, more aggressive than they have been? to actually stomp out inflation. Do we, I mean, if you're going to reset the environment, you know, the economic environment in this country, you get past the election, do you raise, if you're a federal chairman Powell, um, do you raise rates? Do you get them over 10%? Well, considering that now we have such so much debt in this country, he's in a catch-22. If I don't raise rates, I don't get rid of inflation. But if I do raise rates, I put the government in more of a of a debt spiral, okay? Sure. Um, because we can't afford to pay these interest rates. I mean, interest uh, bonds are coming off the books, you know, in the Treasury Department at you know half a percent interest, and they're spending those into T bills at five point four percent. True. I mean, so we're paying that. So the interest on our debt, or not only is our debt getting higher. But interest on our debt is getting higher, too, and that's unsustainable. So what are you going to do? I mean, really, what are you going to do? Now, from a from a debt point of view, inflation is good. If you have a lot of debt, inflation is good, okay? So anyway, that's where he's at. And it depends on who wins because one of the candidates you know, will keep him and the other candidate says <laughs> he's gone. You know, yeah. so, you know, huh. again, so everything's political. And I think the only thing that we have to worry about is just – regular guys and regular people who watch this is, you know, fend for yourself and understand what's going on and don't listen, you know, to, to people on the, on the, my dad called it the boob tube, you know, TV, don't listen mm-hmm. to them blindly and don't and be sure you question them. And it seems like anymore, if you question anything, all of a sudden you're on the enemy list or, you know, you're, uh, you're misinformation. We used to be able to talk and discuss and like you and I are now, and mm-hmm. have different points of view and, and then go out and have a beer afterwards. Now we can't do that. You know, one side wants to jail the other side at all times, you know, and and uh, unless we turn that around, you know, I don't see that we're going to have much of a country left to, to deal with. I, I mean, he... we're all Americans and we all want to succeed, I think. I do. Yeah. I want everyone to succeed. That's why we do what we do here. Right. I think, it. you know, I look at this more and more and we as human beings are extreme. We go in extreme patterns. And, you know, we saw this during what the, you know, prior to the Great Depression. Um, we had an extremeness in the wealth growth, you know, and then the thing broke. Um, we're very extreme right now, both politically, socially, and economically and those are you think about those are three pillar you know three legs of the of the stool and when they get so spread out from each other at some point they're going to snap back and you have some extreme snapback until you normalize and i i honestly think something is going to snap that if it's one is going to trigger the other and i hope it's not uh you know a so you know civil war element to this hope that doesn't happen um yet you know economically i think that's where it starts i think you know if people the average american can't go into grocery outlet just down the road here from me here where i'm staying in spokane washington and they can't afford to put food on their their kids you know their t- uh, family's table they're going to get pissed and you're going to see that come out. Um, and I, I think you'll see that in the election. Question is, is, is either or party better for the economy and better for the American family? I think, I think policies are, okay. Mm-hmm. And I think that without being too political, all you have to do is understand in the last three and a half, four years, what policies are in place right now and how are you doing? And that's the question everyone asks. If you're doing better, then you know your answer. If you're doing worse, then you know your answer. Yeah. Okay. Because you can't that's a really get any good point. different. You can't even get different on the two choices we have on their policies are totally opposite. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, we can go back and we can look at 
both of them have been in four years, so we can see what's happened. Okay, the only thing that the current administration has not had is a really the start of a pandemic in shutting down the economy, which right. I think after we've seen hearings this week, that will be dealt with a lot differently uh, by regular Americans as far as their trust in what uh, federal officials tell us uh, and what they might actually follow. Yeah, I think so too. Wow. And again, and again, I'm sitting as a regular guy sitting right here in the middle of the country. So, you know, we're not, we're not living the jet set life. You know, we're living a good life here. I like living here, but we're not flying across the country. We're not making millions of dollars to be on CNBC and managing all this money and, you know, living a life above everybody else. But again, 65, 70% of all Americans live paycheck to paycheck. If your paycheck is a, is $100 a hundred dollars a week, okay, and now you have twenty percent inflation, so now your paychecks, you know, you're only making eighty, okay, dollars a week, and then you talk about on top of the purchasing power, if your purchasing power goes down five percent, uh, you know, a year, okay, now you're at you're at seventy five dollars is what you have, and and your rent went up, your insurance went up, your food went up, but your purchasing power went down, and that's what most Americans are up against right now, and yeah. who cares about them? Look at Washington, look at who's actually talking about you and helping you out. No, they're just making trades on information they have and making right. millions I mean, of you dollars. Look, you know, and, and you know, and, and you're worried about you know naming post offices and this and that, and, and it's you know our priorities are definitely off uh, from my point of view. Yeah, but you know, I try to live my life. I try to you know do everything right. Um, again, I I was at I was telling you the other day, we went on a car rally, 500 cars, 500 miles. Had to be 30 years old for the cars. And and I was one of the youngest ones participating, I think, in that rally. And I looked around and, you know, why is that? Well, older people really like old cars because it was part of their history, okay? All right. the cars that I saw, you know, 69s and whatever, those are what I drove in high school, okay? Number two, older people are now more retired and they can have time to do that. And number three, they save money, okay? And they save their car. The, all these people know how to work on their own cars. You know, they fix their own cars. They fix their own houses. You know, they've saved money, you know. And they didn't spend like we see today, you know, spending. When when my mom and dad, when I moved to California, my mom and dad didn't even have a credit card to come out. So they had to get a credit card so they could fly and rent a car, you know. And that's just the mentality. You, you didn't pay for anything unless you had the money to do it. And then you get into the 80s and the 90s, you know, and everyone spend, spend, spend. And then we get into the, you know, the 2000s and we go into the financial crisis, kind of did a little reset. But, the, you know, the government came in with the Fed policy and it hit zero interest rates and then kept them that way instead of moving them back to normal, which is about where we are today. Yeah. Now everyone's panicking because all that spending and credit on zero is now coming, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost. And so... I can see why there's such despair in Americans' life today and in and, 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 and what they see in the future and younger people who can't afford homes <clears throat> and even older people who can't afford to retire, okay? Yeah. And a lot of that, a lot of that is, is, is partially the, you know, the way that we've, we've run our interest rates and a lot of that's on individual people, you know? Because I know a lot of people that saw that and they saved all their life. They didn't spend over expense excessively. They didn't get the best house. They didn't get the best car. They didn't eat the best food. They didn't take the best vacations. They sacrificed and now they're living a better life. And now right. they're just hoping that they have enough money, you know, with inflation and and the, and, and the devaluation of the dollar to make it, you know, to where they want it and leave their kids something. You know, this that's one thing I a lot of people when you calculate if you're going to have enough for retirement, most advisor, financial advisors calculate inflation based on the number that the government gives you, which is what, three, four percent. And when you calculate the true inflation number, you wouldn't retire. I don't know anybody in the 20 some years I was a financial advisor who would have retired when they had planned to unless they did a massive economic reduction in their 
rest of life expenses. And most can't because of health costs. And that's a result of not taking care of yourself at a younger age, you know? Um, but I think that is going to be a big wall that we're going to see this next, you know, my age group in the fifties, your age group and so on. who are going to start running into this wall of, Oh, I can't, you know, I'm 10 years into retirement and I'm running out of money real fast, um, which causes a lot of other big problems, unfortunately. So oh, and then on top of that, you know, you have social security that is expected to go negative in 20, 30 something. That's less than 10 years away. Okay. Yeah. So they're talking about, they might have to cut that by 20%. Okay. Well, people have had that in their retirement plan. Okay. At least I have this. Okay. Yeah. But even that even cut back with your purchasing power in 10 years and who knows what inflation is going to take it. What is that? So, but again, we have a, a situation where that money was supposed to be in a lockbox, wasn't. Right. There's a bunch of IOUs in there. I don't care what they say. They took it and funded this and funded that. And we'll pay it back later. And uh, that is why the founders were so strongly opposed to a strong federal government. They wanted more states' rights. And you can go back and see all the arguments that they had about states' rights versus federal rights. And it all came from being under a king for so long. They didn't want another monarchy telling each state what to do. It was a it was a big it was a big deal in you know the Continental Congress to, you know, ratify, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence is, you know, how do we break up, you know, how do we break up and the Constitution, how do we break up the government and have checks and balances? Because we don't want a monarch to tell us what to do. And that's where we came up with our seat three sec, you know, we got the executive judicial wow. Uh, and uh, legislative branches of, of the government. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, I think I think as as investors, you have to be a student of history too, and mm -hmm. and you also have to know that you know we're we're human, and and history does repeat itself, and we are bound to do the same thing over and over again, and and that's what we're seeing, you know, and we're not the only ones. The Romans did it. Uh, uh, the Spanish did it. The British did it. Everyone who was a world power did it. You know, that's unfortunate. You know, and you keep as we've been talking for the last like five minutes or so. I keep thinking all of a sudden, I'm like, what's an asset that will that's limited, that's all of a sudden become very popular, and people are gravitating to it. That isn't affected by sales or earnings per share growth or revenue or anything like that or organizations or governments and and who is a who are the biggest money managers in the entire world who all of a sudden have adopted this and that's that's bitcoin bitcoin and i don't i don't want to be like one of these bitcoin freaks or hodlers the whole bit it's more of it could be like it could be you know it could be crayons for for all all that matters you know it could be whatever it's you got to look at this and go okay if all this transacts as you and i have talked about for a year where is the asset class that's going to go up and i think it you gotta consider bitcoin as an example of that you know i've, I've been advocating i've been watching it since 2020 and it took me a couple of years to get the aha moment. I, okay, I, I kind of understand it. And then to the point that, you know, I'm talking to my friends and my friends are all mostly retired. And, you know, it's so easy to poo-poo something, you know, whether it's a new cell phone or, you know, yeah. a computer with, you know, DOS on it. That'll never work, you know, or whatever. Uh, but technology moves beyond that. And, and the more I talk to them, it takes about two years. And then all of a sudden they, they kind of get it. And they're like, yeah, you know, I think I could try that. And I think the way that I get most of it is I can break it down into one Bitcoin. There's only 21 million, but one Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshis in it. Okay. And you can buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin if you want. And you, whatever you get, a, you can get a zero, 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 zero point, you know, all the way down. And 
to get one tenth of a Bitcoin, I always say is right now we're at 69,000 on a Bitcoin. Okay. You can buy one tenth of a Bitcoin for $6,900. And we, okay, if that goes to 100,000, Bitcoin goes to 100,000, you're now at $10,000. Okay. You've made $3,100 on that. Yeah. Okay. And I always say, you know, on any, on any uh, asset or equity, security, whatever you buy, there's risk reward. So your your risk is that it goes to zero, which I don't think it's going to do. So you would lose $6,900, but your reward is upside, okay? With everything that's happening and, and knowing that there's only 21 million and it's a supply demand issue, demand is high, supply is low, and we see who's buying it. You know, you just got to logically say, well, if I had a 10th of a Bitcoin and it goes to a million dollars, okay? Let's just say I did. And everyone's like, oh, that'll never happen. They never thought it would go from a quarter to 25 cents to $100 either. Or now we're at 69000 Right. If you had a million dollars and you had a tenth of a Bitcoin, you'd have $100,000 off your $6,900. Okay. So for me, you know, and retired people, it's an asset class now. The, the SEC has approved spot Bitcoin ETFs. They're looking at Ethereum, uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, every uh, Kathy Wood. They're all buying it now. Okay. It's out there. Uh, now we've got home offices buying it. We've got co sovereign countries buying it. We got banks buying it. Okay. So it's no longer this taboo that it was, you know, two years ago. Yeah. Um, and so if they're buying it, you know, you got to take a little, little pause and say, okay, I'm just not going to poo poo it. But I had two friends of mine came in. They just, re they, they retired years ago and they travel around the country in two different sets. And, and they're my age, and I and I'm sitting on the deck having a margarita with them, and, and I brought up Bitcoin, and they said, "Oh no, blah blah blah," you know this and that. And I said, "Well, so it ta usually takes two years for me to convince any of my friends that it's decent. So if I start right now, we start talking weekly, and in two years, you guys will be ready to buy." I said, "But in two years, it'll probably be two hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin potentially. Right. You could buy it now for sixty nine hundred dollars, you know, for a tenth or twenty thousand dollars, you know, for a yeah. tenth in two years." You know, Kathy Woods has come out and said Bitcoin at 3.8 million, I think, or something like that. Right. And I've always thought that's ridiculous. You know, that's really out there. But in just in the last couple of minutes, as you were talking, I'm like thinking to myself, if all of a sudden your purchasing power of your U.S. dollar went from, what, 80 cents on the dollar today to 40 cents, most people aren't going to recognize that. But the smart money is anticipating it and they're going and they're looking at going, what's an asset on a global scale that could be the hedge, you know, yeah. not a yeah. full per, you know, not a hundred percent, but a hedge. And I, I think it's it this that. way. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I didn't mean no, to it's all right. And, and so I think her, I'm starting to wonder, I'm sorry, as we're talking about this, I'm speaking out loud. I'm starting to wonder if she's maybe she's thinking like that extreme move in the strength of the United States, the potential for the Fed to jump rates up higher after the election, the, you know, just social crumbling of, of our environment, you know, of our country. All these extremes of this, you know, the three pillars of the stool all of a sudden go flat. And this become and Bitcoin becomes the that's the refuge. And it, the way I look at it is I can take my devaluing dollars, okay, and buy Bitcoin and, and take my dollars, and now my dollars have been converted to this digital property called Bitcoin and it sits there. Okay. So I'm out of, my dollars are now not devaluing they're in Bitcoin. Now Bitcoin can go up and down in price. And we just talked about why we think it's going to go up. But at any time, okay, I'm not saying the dollar's going away or the franc's going away or, you know, euro yeah. or whatever's going, you know. I can take that money, move it somewhere, and I can, I can buy euros with it at the regular euro price. Or I can come back and I can convert it back to dollars and to buy something at a better price. So let's say I, I take it out today throw it into Bitcoin. And in a year, I want to buy the, the market goes to crap and I want to buy a condo down in your neighborhood. And now the condos are 
you know, half price of what they were. The money's half price. I can take my, and my Bitcoin is now, you know, from 69,000 to 250,000. So my money actually has increased. I take that value, come back and buy back into a, you know, a lesser dollar to pay for a lesser condo. And then I put it back in when I, you know, and so I look at it as just a place to keep it out of dollars that are deflationary, you know, they're going down into an asset that's going up and an asset that I can move in my pocket, you know, or transfer somewhere really quick. You know, it's really what you just described is no different than what, you know, buying NVIDIA 12 months ago. You move from one asset where you made money, you bought a lower priced asset in anticipation of you had a thesis behind it and NVIDIA is now triple the price. It's it's really you, you take the names off the assets, and it, it's basically management. It's 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 what we teach in you know the platinum swing trading. It's buy here, sell it up here, wait for another asset to come back to be here and buy it here. It's that buy low, sell high. It's really not that complicated. It's just a different asset, and it has a different narrative behind it. That I. You know, I I, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't consider like an equity like NVIDIA or IBM or whoever no. as a store of value for me. I, I see the S&P being used as that for people. Okay. But, you know, NVIDIA has a has a board. It has shareholders. Sure. It can, no, uh, no, no. It can uh, increase its number of shares devaluing the investor us. Bitcoin does not do that. Okay? No, but what, what, what I'm talking about is you take your Bitcoin that's risen here, your house, you know, your condo price went here. Right. You're just moving the asset to buy another asset in anticipation when that asset goes up and you have a fluctuation in Bitcoin or you, you need to store it somewhere. You know, you sell your condo and you store it in store. You know, it's a, it's a, like you said, a store of value. It's the same if you had bought treasuries you know, and you move that money to buy NVIDIA a year ago. It's um, my point isn't the uh, the name of the company or name of the asset. It's the process. It's the process. Um, and storing your dollars in U.S. dollars, storing your money in U.S. dollars is not actually yeah. working for you. Yeah, I see your, I see what you're doing. I just look at, I look at it a little different. I look at that as. Money moves to where the value is on a on a short term basis, like a swing trade, yeah. which is what you know, video this or that. For a long term, you know, and if, instead of throwing my cash into a money market or a treasury bill, I would stick it over into an asset like Bitcoin, yeah, where I know it's limited and it, and it can't be deflated away, and you don't have yield curves that do this and that, you know. True. And I mean, you have prices that go up and down. But if you truly understand what it is, you truly believe it. This is a, for me a better asset, and I just let it sit there. And it and I mean it's gone up since 15 years. It's been around. It's what 140 percent a year. Okay, oh, it's, yeah. on average. Okay, find me another asset that's done that. Now Nvidia yeah. went up a little bit. Go look at MicroStrategy stock compared to Nvidia stock in the last year. MicroStrategy is way higher, I think, because they their treasury is is all Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. All I got to say is if Bitcoin gets to a million or 3.8 million, a whole lot of problems are going on. I mean, holy cow. If it goes to a, a if it goes part. if it goes to a million and then you're going to have to find another partner on the regular guy show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be somewhere drinking a margarita or a mai tai with my okay. people. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, with my friends and then my friends who did get into it are going to be bitching at me like why didn't you tell me and i'm going to right. re remember that time on my deck you know yeah exactly yeah well i i i'm in favor of it i look at it as you know i look at where money is flowing uh, i look at where smart money is going and well, it's and an asset look, class that, to consider you got to look at your currency Okay, what's yeah. happening to your currency? We save money, we throw it in a bank. That's what we were taught to do. Throw your money in a bank, you get an interest rate, you know, but now you throw your money in a bank and if you get 
2%, is that beating inflation? Is that beating the purchasing power is going down because we're printing so much money in, in T-bills now? No, you're not, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're actually losing money. And, and to the point you said earlier, how do you ever retire when you know, you're saving you know, 7%, but you're losing 7% after, after everything? Right. Okay, you're, you're just not getting ahead. It looks like you are, but you're really not. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it, as a consumer, as a you know, in, a regular person, you know, regular person out there, you have to look at how you're calculating your future, ex, you know, expenses. How you're calculating your future retirement. And I know, I would say probably ninety nine percent of all financial advisors are calculating the cost of, you know, inflation at a, you know, low single digits. And it really isn't that. And I think that's where, you know, if somebody's watching this, they have to go to that advisor and it's, you know, it's not their fault. It's just what it is and say, listen, plug that retirement number with inflation at 20% and tell me what I'm at. And, you know, it is what it is. The numbers are going to come back way lower and than you expected in the probability of having a full retirement. And if that's what the case is, then plan for it. Start adjusting, work with that person and say, listen, this is the truth. This is what's happening. Let's build a plan around it. And I think that's what we're trying to teach here is, is that look at the truth of this, look at the reality and start positioning. And it's, to me, to me, it's a different asset management world than it was 20 years ago when I got in this business. Way different. And you have to adjust. If you're just going to buy into the old, oh, it's gone up for a hundred years, you know, saying you're screwed. <laughs> I mean, just you're screwed. So take a different approach to life, different approach to retirement, and you, you can have a good retirement. Yeah, and I think you, you you look it around and see what's happening in your environment, like you just did in Spokane and talk to people and, mm -hmm. and just look around and, and see if what you see matches what you're being told. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, Fen, you know, the only one who's looking out for you is you. Okay. And if you don't take control, uh, no one else cares. Okay. And so as two regular guys, we just sit and we've been through some of this stuff before and we have a great uh, discord and a great membership on the platinum. And, and when we have our, our calls on Fridays, it, it, we have people from all over the world on those calls and we get a lot of different views of what's happening. And it just enlightens me a lot to, to either confirm or, or not confirm my beliefs and what I'm seeing. Uh, and it's just a really good group. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have two different levels. We have premium plus, which is, the twenty dollar level, you get a uh, an abbreviated version of Carrie's cheat sheet. You get a uh, uh, the call on uh, Friday with Carrie's uh, tribe group, um, and you get the Discord and uh, the the bus twelve and thirteen portfolios, and a lot of good discussion back and forth. And then the platinum, which is sixty dollars a month, you get Mark Swing Trading lists every Monday. You get the cheat, full on cheat sheet that Kerry created for uh, the socks he, he follows. You get the ETF tracker. You get a whole lot of other things. You get the platinum call on Friday with Mark and I. And uh, and then Kerry's call as well at three o'clock central on uh, Friday as well. So it's really, you get a ton and we're adding more. We're talking more about crypto. We have a crypto section on the Discord and we're also talking options as well more long-term approach or using option approach. So you get a whole lot in the platinum. I, I would encourage you to, you know, if you're watching this, encourage you to subscribe to the platinum channel. Um, if it isn't for you, um, you can cancel anytime, but I think what you're going to find is a way to solve or per risk manage these things that we've talked about in the last hour, um, which has been an hour. Wow. Uh, <laughs> we could go on forever. Um, but I think, uh, this is a great benefit to people. So, so let's wrap it up there. Um, since it has been an hour, yeah, <laughs> um, a quick hour. it has been, um, and, uh, we'll go from there. So from Mark and myself, Trent, we are two regular guys. 
part of Best of US Investors. Come join us and we'll see you next week.